Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Far Post podcast. We are finally back for our first episode between regular season games now that the season is back in August. It's been a long time, Jeff, since we've had multiple matches to talk about. And how excited are you to just be back into a rhythm? It is. I mean, there's, it's a rhythm. You're trying to figure out what the rhythm is. What's weird is we started playing games like every three or four days, and I got really used to that. So now this six-day this six gap between games almost feels too long which I know it isn't. I know everyone needed a little bit of a break between games, but now I'm like, well, what happened to the games? I'm ready for another game. So it's, it's, I'm ready for, I'm ready for Saturday night for sure. I feel like that kind of sounds like the Goldilocks story. You know, it's the porch too cold, too hot. You need something just right a little. I'm very, very picky. (laughs) Well, we are lucky enough to be joined by a special guest today, midfielder Tommy McNamara who's making his first ever appearance on the Revolution Far Post podcast. He debuted for the Revs on the field a few weeks ago. Tommy, thanks for joining us here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, we're super excited to get to talk with you. And, you know, you're in the hot seat right now, so a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure. But uh, a little less than a month ago, you were acquired by the Revs from the Houston Dynamo. How quickly did that process kind of happen, bringing you up to New England? Was it a bit of a whirlwind? Yeah, it was uh, it was very quick. Um, I got the news either a Friday or Saturday night. I forget which. I think it was Saturday night um, when I we with the Houston Dynamo we had a game amongst ourselves, and so right when I got into the stadium, I got told the news, and I went home and I was on a flight in less than twenty four hours up here to try to get up here as fast as I could and start the quarantine clock. Oh wow! And when you were told the news, what were your emotions when you were? told that you were coming up to New England. Yeah, I mean, at first I was surprised. Um, so it took me kind of a minute to, to process the whole situation. Um, but once I did, I was, I was very excited. Uh, I felt like this was a good place for me, um, both on the field, but even off the field. And so I was just very excited to get up here and to get that clock running to eventually get myself into the team and around everybody. I know, Tommy, this was such a unique year that this, you know, being traded and moving mid-season right now is different than any other move you could have possibly made because of the circumstances of the, of the pandemic. But as someone who has moved amongst MLS teams a couple of times, does it get any easier kind of making the transition into a new locker room when it's not the first time you've had to kind of settle in with a new group? Yeah, you know, it definitely helps being in the league for a number of years now. So you kind of know – all the people that you're competing against. Um, I wouldn't say that I had necessarily a relationship with anybody on the team, but, you know, playing against guys that have been here for a while, you kind of know, you say hello on the field, that type of thing. And so that made it certainly easier. And uh, Jeff Caldwell, we played together for a year in New York City. So it was another guy that I did know well. Um, So yeah, it gets, it gets easier. The more time you're in the league, you kind of know people, it gets easier for sure. Being in the league for so long, head coach Bruce Arena mentioned prior to you coming up that he thought that you were a good locker room guy in presence. How have you kind of settled in with your teammates now that you've had a few weeks to kind of get to know them both in and out of the locker room? Yeah, it's been great. Uh, it's a really good group of guys um, top to bottom. They've been very welcoming, uh, you know, helping me kind of figure out my living situa- situation out a little bit if I have questions. Um, and they really kind of just welcomed me with open arms, uh, you know, and so that makes the transition significantly easier when you have a group of people that are good people, first and foremost. Um, and that goes for my teammates, but even just the staff, the rest of the club, like you guys, um, you know, everybody's been very nice to me and it makes the transition transition much easier. We like to think that we have a good group of people around us, right, Jeff? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're going to start taking credit next now when results start going well on the field. We're going to start telling our bosses, be like, well, you know, it, the, the more welcome we, we are to new players, it makes the transition easy for them. They play better on the field. So we want, we want some of that credit for the results on the field, too. <laughs> and I know you talked a little bit about uh, the players just being really welcoming. Is there anyone in particular that's kind of um, taking them? I know you're, you're a veteran in the league at this point, but like under, your, under their wing in the sense of getting to know New England, the locker room and just the area. No, I mean, I wouldn't say there's one particular player that's, like, really gone out of their way. You know, I'm experienced enough, and I know the area a bit going to school in, down in Providence. Um, and so, no, I, I, it, that part of things, like, hasn't been difficult for me. I feel very comfortable being here in the Northeast again. Um, 
so all that stuff's been good but no everybody's been great like if i have questions or whatever they you know it's no problem they tell me right away and that type of thing i know we're gonna we're gonna talk about providence a little bit eventually because you do have some experience in the area but i'm interested to know being someone who you mentioned has been in a league for a while but has also played with a few different teams you'd mentioned you kind of get to know guys on other teams a little bit at least in passing but you might not necessarily know them all that well so have you ever had a situation where there was a particular opponent who you had a certain perception of you kind of thought of them in a certain way and then they became your teammate and that perception totally changed in terms of like the type of person they they actually were did anyone ever surprise you in that way uh not so much to be honest i don't really have much of a, of a perception of other players except for maybe you know one or two around the league other than that i kind of just don't really think about you know what other players or other guys are doing so much um so no i there's no example that like really comes to my mind when you look back on some of the experiences that you've had with other teams whether that's houston new york city fc what are what's some of the biggest lessons that you've taken from them that you can bring up to new england now yes Oh man, there's a lot of lessons along the years. Uh, you know, I think the the biggest thing that I took in this whole process was just making sure that I was fit and I was ready. Uh, that's something that I kind of learned in my career. Maybe a little bit the harder way of when you're not playing and you're not playing games, you're not really game fit. And, you know, you're doing your training and stuff like that. And maybe you're doing some extra work and, you know, sometimes you think you're good and you're fit and you're ready when you get an opportunity, but maybe it's not quite you're not quite as ready as you would like to be. And so, you know, something that I, I learned, uh, I've learned that the hard way, like I said, a little bit. Um, so when quarantine happened and we were at home, it was like a priority of mine was to not only stay fit, to actually get fitter. And then, you know, we went down to the MLS's back tournament and I was, I was in a really good place physically. And, you know, I didn't play much with Houston at the time in that tournament. And, so we came back and it was still a priority of mine to, to be fit. And then it worked out that the trade came and happened up here. And, you know, I do feel good and I do feel fit and I'm able to kind of enter the team right away. And I don't have to worry about necessarily building a lot of a fitness base. Well, we've seen your fitness so far for the Revs. And I know you mentioned that was a priority for you during quarantine when you guys weren't playing. What did you do individually to keep up that fitness and ramp it up, as you mentioned? Yeah, it was a lot of running, obviously. I mean, we were stuck at home, so we had a bike, which was great. We'd do a little bit, a few bike workouts. They gave us, you know, like a couple of dumbbells, some exercise bands, that type of thing, so we could do some sort of, you know, lifting weights and injury prevention stuff. But really what I did a lot was run. I, I, I went, I found about over the course of, I don't know what it was, six weeks, seven weeks that we were stuck. I went out and ran at, you know, parks, at tracks, at fields. It was like, it ended up being like five or six different places because I'd get there for a week and nobody would say anything and I'd be okay. But by the end of the week, like a security guard would be like, oh no, this is closed. And so I'd have to go find another area to go do it. And yeah. I give you a lot of credit because Houston's hot. So running in the summer there, like that's gotta be a tough one. <laughs> It is hot. Yeah. It makes the fitness a little easier though, I suppose on the backside of things, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely hot and humid down there. I'm sure. Are you more of a long distance runner or a sprinter when it comes to going out and running? I mean, I don't know. I'm certainly not the fastest. Uh, I do a little bit of both, a little bit of interval work with sprints, a little bit of longer distance for, you know, obviously not quite as fast and kind of just important to do a little bit of everything. Absolutely. And I, I know you mentioned earlier that you're familiar with the area up here with uh, going to school in, at Brown and then also just playing a couple summers. I've read online that you were with the Western Pioneers for a little bit. Um, so just how familiar were you with the area when you came back up? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I've been to Boston once or twice, but to be honest, I didn't really fully I didn't fully understand what the city was like. Um, so now being up here, kind of had the opportunity to go in once or twice and kind of just drive around, walk around a little bit and, and explore then the, you know, the couple of different neighborhoods and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I obviously I lived in Providence three and a half years, two of those summers I lived at school for the summer. Um, and so then, like you mentioned, like played with a local team, Western Mass Pioneers. I played a couple of team, couple of games with uh, in Worcester, 
so yeah, I mean, like this area just around Foxborough and Gillette, um, I'm definitely familiar with it. And, I mean, definitely, I feel like a lot of people who aren't from New England don't actually realize that Foxborough and where Gillette Stadium is and where the training center is, is actually a couple miles closer to Providence than it is to Boston. So obviously Boston gets a lot of the, the pub around here uh, in, terms of, in terms of cities, but a lot of people talk about Providence being kind of an underrated city. I mean, is, is Providence kind of that, that under the radar type of city having spent some years there? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it was the perfect place to go to college because you had, you know, the campus and the school, but right next to it was a small city. So it was nice. You, you weren't going to get lost in it. You can, you know, understand it easily. And there was some stuff going on. Um, I haven't been back in a number of years, but I've heard from friends that have been back that uh, you know, I believe the government is putting more money into the city to try to entice, you know, corporations and companies to come work there. And, you know, as a result, more younger people are moving in and, you know, there's, there's restaurants being built, there's, you know, apartment buildings being built and the city is kind of even more up and coming from when I was there. So no, it's, it's definitely a very nice city. We have a lot of a lot of Rhode Island fans too, so they would know spots. Did you have any spots in Providence that were any like go-to type places for you? Uh, I mean, it was Thayer Street for us because we literally the campus is on Thayer Street, and you know you had everything that you needed there from restaurants, you know, CVS, things like that. It was all right there, and you know only had to walk a block or two depending on where you were. Um, so that's what I'm most familiar with. I know you've talked about. Providence and places that you used to go when you were there, but you did mention that you've gotten into Boston once or twice. What was what was your first impression of the area? Yeah, it was um, it was nice. It, it, it reminded me of a northeastern city, um, and it's different when you go and live and 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 visit a southern city, like just how they're set up and you know what is city and not city. And yeah, uh, I went in for. I forget it was a concert for somebody this is going back a number of years when I was in school and I think the other time was kind of just driving through so I really didn't spend much time but uh you know I'm excited to kind of spend more of my time now in the city and you know unfortunately it's COVID but at least get to understand it a little bit more. Absolutely it's a fun spot so I'm sure uh you'll enjoy exploring it when you get the chance. And switching gears a little bit let's talk about the big 2-1 win that you guys had at the Chicago Fire this past weekend. After the 2-0 home loss to New York City FC, it seemed like it almost lit a fire under this group a bit. Matt Polster said that it could have been a wake-up call for the team. So how important was it for this group to bounce back with that victory it went out in the Windy City? Yeah, I think it was incredibly important to, to get a win in that game. Uh, you know, obviously we had the game before that was Red Bulls at home and we tied. So we kind of dropped two points. And then the game at home against New York City, we obviously lost. And so it's kind of dropping three points at home. So it's, it's a little bit too many points to be dropping at home. So it was incredibly important to, to get three points in that game and to keep ourselves up the table. Um, you know, we were challenged as a group to be fully committed and to sacrifice ourselves for each other to get this result. And, you know, whether we played well, or we didn't play well, or things went well, or things didn't go well, maybe we were unlucky or something like that. Really, the biggest thing was, you know, we need to fight for each other, we need to fight for the group, and we need to give everything we have to try to come away with three points. And, you know, we, we didn't play as well as we wanted to, and there was a lot to work on, and it's kind of nice to have this week-long break to start addressing those things. But at the end of the day, we fought for those three points, and, you know, we ended up deserving them. You mentioned everybody fighting for those three points. And I think teamwork was probably one of the biggest words that stuck with me after that game. And you in particular played a big role in that opening goal when you were playing the ball to Bunbury, who was able to put it away. And you also got that header from Adam and were able to kind of use that to set up that goal. What was going through your head in that moment? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, the, I think, I forget how the ball turned over. I know they, they tried to clear it and then cleared it, cleared it into Gustavo. And as soon as I saw the ball, I was in the area. As soon as I saw him kind of flick the ball up in the air to Adam, I, you know, noticed the space in behind because they stepped to him. And so I just tried to take advantage of the space and hope that he would be able to win the header and put it into my path. And he did a great job. He knew exactly what I was doing. He put it right into my path. And then I took the touch. Um, I saw Teal at the back post. So, I mean, that was a very committed run by him. He 
it's very easy for a player that sees someone shooting to kind of just be like, oh, he's going to shoot and not kind of still attack the space in case the ball gets passed or if there's a rebound. But he was committed to his run and I was able to lay it off to him and he had a great finish. And with that too, you, I mean, you've only been in New England for two weeks, but in that span, you've been able to adapt so quickly to your teammates. What's allowed you to do that? Yeah, um, it, a little bit of everything. You know, when I was here and I wasn't able to train, I, I tried to watch training, um, how I could to just kind of see the tendencies of the players, where they want the ball, what they're looking for, that type of thing. And then, you know, I watched a couple of games of their past games from the MLS is back tournament to study it more. What's the team trying to do as a group? And again, kind of individual player tendencies. And then, you know, when I came in here, like I said, it's been easy. It's a good group of guys. It's intelligent players. Um, we want to play with the ball. We want to be on the front foot. And so it's easy to kind of that suits me well. So that also helps the style is you know similar so it's easy for me to transition in that regard too but I definitely did my homework to try to speed up the process of getting myself into the team I feel like it's it's such a nuanced part of the game that watching casually obviously you would never notice but for the players on the field who have played quite a bit together and who have kind of learned those tendencies I mean how much does it eventually become second nature with guys of knowing what types of runs your teammates might be making where they might like a ball played, where they like to receive the ball, where they might be playing you the ball and how you might have to adjust it. How much does all that stuff become second nature for guys who are playing together every day? Yeah, you know, it, it, for the most part, it does with most guys. Uh, obviously, there's exceptions to everything, but that's an extremely important thing. And you see the teams that generally are successful are the teams that kind of keep a strong core group of guys together that kind of not only run the locker room and the group and that type of thing, but they understand almost second nature at that point, how to play with each other. And so when you receive a ball, if you're unfamiliar with someone, you kind of, you know, you have a half a second hesitation because you're like, I want to play into his feet, but does he want the ball into his feet or is he trying to play in behind? And so you have that like little split second hesitation that, you know, sometimes slows things up. Um, and maybe they're doing something different than what you're prepared to do, and maybe that do play doesn't even come off. But, yeah, once you once you work with people on a consistent basis in training, especially in preseason and then, of course, in games, you understand, you know, when I get the ball in this position, uh, this player is going to spin off the back shoulder, and so I know I don't have to think about it. I can take one touch and put it in behind. And Tommy, the refs have been struggling a little bit to score goals in recent games, but we're able to put two away at Chicago. I know you just spoke about being able to get to know players' tendencies. So as this group starts to play more frequent games, how close does it feel that you guys are to finding that offensive breakthrough? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think since I've been here, uh, maybe not so much the Chicago game, but in all the other games, we've done a really good job of, getting ourselves as a team into really good, dangerous situations on the field and places on the field. But um, we struggled a little bit to, to fully capitalize on that and then end up with a really good goal scoring chance. And so I think what was good to see about Chicago is, you know, unfortunately we didn't have quite as many situations as previous games, but when we did get into those situations, we were able to develop, and create a really good goal scoring opportunity that led to the first goal, um, even led to the second goal, to be quite honest. And so that's a positive. And so now we kind of need to combine both of those areas. And hopefully, hopefully that comes now with this week of training, we have the game and, you know, moving forward. What's been interesting to see too, is, you know, you talk about get, having that success at Chicago, you guys had that success at DC United too, the week prior. And, it's been a little bit of a different year for a lot of reasons, but one of them moving forward has been the same day regional travel for this group. So, I mean, when you have that same day travel, how have you guys been able to still find that success away from home? Yeah. Um, you know, I can't speak for the DC game cause I was still under quarantine, but for the, with the Chicago game, uh, you know, that was my first time experiencing that first day travel um, or the same day travel, I should say. And it's really just about being as professional as you can be, as, as being prepared for the game during the week, trying to get rest the night before, the two nights before, to make sure that, you know, you know this flight's coming up. And, you know, the club's done a great job. It's very smooth, uh, you know, making sure we get to the flight on time, no problems. The flight takes off. We're all taken care of on the flight. We got, 
you know, snacks or drinks if we need. Um, and then a very smooth transition into the hotel and, you know, you have your food and then you have some time to rest. And so I think the club has done a very good job handling it and the players as well about being professional about it. And it's not normal, but we're going to make the most of it. So is the day just kind of laid out for you guys? You'll go in and kind of the motions of travel are, ju are just set? Excuse me? When you guys go through that process, are the motions of the travel just kind of set so everyone kind of just shows you where to go and it's a, it's a little bit of an easy process in that regard? Yeah, yeah, it's very easy. I mean, it, it's either you meet at the training facility and take a bus up to the, to the airport and you will go walk right on the plane or you can go drive directly to the, you know, to the hangar yourself and you just walk right on the plane. Everything's taken care of. Everything's taken care of when you get off. You can go straight to the hotel. The food's ready for you, so... Yeah, it makes the process a lot easier, a lot smoother, and it's a lot less wasted time of kind of doing nothing. You mentioned, Tommy, even though you guys don't stay over, you do still have that period where you have an opportunity to go to the hotel and you have a team meal and you've got a room for whether it's, you know, five, six, seven hours to, to kind of rest and relax. And I know because of the circumstances with COVID right now, everybody has their own hotel rooms. You had your own hotel room uh, when you're at the MOS's back tournament. I know you're still hanging out a lot alone in a hotel room right now, even in New England. So you spend a lot of time alone in hotel rooms. But are you the type of guy who, if given the preference, would choose to have that, that time alone? Or would you prefer to have a roommate and have somebody there? I would um, – I see both sides of it and the pros and cons and why people think one's way is better than the other. I would personally prefer to be on my own just because – you know, especially when you're preparing for a game and that type of thing, like you want to be on, you want to go to sleep when you want to go to sleep and not be worried about someone else up. Or maybe if it's your roommate wants to go to bed earlier, but you still want to be up. Now you're worried about, am I keeping him up and messing up his routine, that type of thing. And so it's just easier because you don't have to kind of try to coordinate your schedule with what you want to do with what they want to do. Um, but I understand the benefit, especially in preseason and when there's new guys in the team to spending even more time together in the hotel room and that type of thing. Yeah. And I feel like I know a lot of people who just can't, they can't even stomach the concept of like sitting in a hotel room by themselves. But yeah. as someone I've, I've lived on my own for years now, like I, I'm one of those people who just really cherishes kind of that alone time. So I'm perfectly fine being alone in a hotel room. But I know some people are like, I don't know. They go crazy a half hour by themselves without someone to talk to. It's there's like two sides of that spectrum. Yeah, no, I'm not on that side. I'm not a massive talker, so I'm okay being alone. <laughs> I think I might fall on the other side of the spectrum as you guys. I like having people around. But Tommy, when you guys are at the hotel for that in between period between when you get there and then before you head to the field for the games, what do you do? Are you the type of player that likes to take a nap? Do you have a pregame routine? What's your schedule that you have during that time? Yeah, I try to take a nap. Um, you know, I can't always fall asleep sometimes. So a lot of the time it's kind of just like really just resting my eyes and kind of just, I don't know, being super low key. But I try to I try to take a nap for about an hour and a half before a game. Okay. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a skill to be able to nap in the middle of the day. I wish I had that talent. <laughs> Not everybody does. So you are blessed in that sense. I can't, um, I, yeah, I'm not a napper. I can't nap. Can't do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually struggle a lot to nap, but the only time I do nap is game days. But a, a normal day during the week, I really can't nap at all. So I don't know. I guess it's maybe just knowing what's tonight. Okay, I need to rest and be prepared. A circumstantial nap. I like that. Mm -hmm. A reason to nap. And uh, as you've been, been getting to know some of your teammates, you're obviously playing in the midfield, and you've played with people such as Matt Polster, Kellen Rowe, Diego Fagundes. How strong of a chemistry have you started to develop with some of these guys that you've partnered with? Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's been growing an improvement, in my opinion, uh, both on the field and off the field. We're all pretty similar. I think we're we're pretty similar players. I think we're we have a little bit of similar personalities a little bit. And so we get along well the way we view the game and what we're trying to accomplish and, you know, what our qualities are, I think, kind of fit well with each other. And mm -hmm. so it's been nice. It's been nice playing with them. Um, for sure, there's room for an improvement. Uh, like I said, it's been so new, but, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful and expecting that it's going to keep improving as time goes on. The Revs just added another face to the midfield with Lee Wynn, who was a former Revolution player from 2012 to 2018, coming up here from Inter-Miami. What was the chatter like in the locker room when the news was announced yesterday? Yeah, uh, no, I think guys were surprised. Um, 
but I think, you know, the group of guys that were here with him for a long period of time, you know, they, they seemed excited to have him back. Um, I think as a group, we're excited to have, you know, more help and, and Lee's a player that's, that's created a lot of goals and scored a lot of his goals in his career and particularly at the revolution. So I think we're excited to kind of get him into the team and, you know, have him be a, a piece that helps us like, you know, like everybody else on the roster. Lee did uh, his introductory press conference today. He said he drove from Florida <laughs> to Massachusetts as soon as he found out the trade had gone down. He hopped in the car and he started driving Miami to Foxborough. Uh, I was interested to know just in context of that, what's the longest road trip you have ever done? Have you ever done something like Florida to Miami and, or Florida to Miami, Miami to, to the Northeast in the car? No, I haven't gone quite that far. The furthest I've gone is New York to South Carolina. So that was like a 12 hour ride. That's about that's the still, that's most I've gotten. That's still a hike. Yeah, it's a decent one to do that in the day. Yeah, that's a long, long time. How many times do you stop over a 12 hour road trip? We stopped. I was with someone else. Um, we were driving down to Clemson when I was at Clemson. So we stopped every three hours. So we stopped four times and we'd switch driving every three hours. Okay, that's good. That makes it a lot better if you're breaking up into driver shifts. Yeah, it made it a lot easier. And some company, you're not just on your own. Oh, yeah, for sure. You get the radio going. Everyone loves a good road trip in that sense, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we were going back to preseason, so it wasn't uh, <laughs> like we were going on vacation or something. All right, well, fair enough. When you're in those type of situations, what, what's your go-to uh, type of music that you listen to in, in cars? Um... I don't really care. I kind of just put on the radio, to be honest. And, you know, whatever I come across that I'm in the mood for at the time, I'm pretty, I don't have a very one specific genre that I'm like, this is what I listen to. I like to listen to essentially all the genres. Um, if I had to say a go-to on a card trip, something like that, I would probably pick like the Lumineers or that type okay. of music, I suppose. Do you have a specific playlist that you listen to on game days? No, no, I just listen to whatever, whatever the guys put on in the locker room. I just listen to that. I don't need to have like specific music and that type of thing. I will say I was doing, I was doing a little bit of research earlier and watched some interviews from New York City FC. And I know you'd mentioned in an interview that your first concert, at least what you thought your first concert was, was Third Eye Blind. And I've been to a bunch of Third Eye Blind shows and I get crap all the time. Uh, our VP of marketing Kahal Conlin, who's on the show uh, sometimes. Every time Third Eye Blind comes up, he like, intentionally calls them three doors down. He thinks it's hilarious. Uh, apparently, it's like a joke that I that I like Third Eye Blind, but it's it's nice to have another Third Eye Blind listener join the, the podcast as well. We need a little solidarity. Yeah, I don't know if I'm an avid listener, if to be honest. It was a group of people going, and I was I was young, man. I was in I was in high school then, and just kind of tagged along. I think it was at Six Flags actually, where the concert was. And <laughs> yeah, that was my first experience. I'm gonna tell everyone well, that sorry, you're a I huge Third Eye Blind fan. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't quite have you <laughs> that much, but you do. If that helps you in your situation, <laughs> by all means, appreciate it. I love the support. And Tommy, you guys are heading to Philadelphia this weekend. How important is it for the group to continue the momentum from the last result with that win at Chicago heading down to the Union? Yeah, it's incredibly important because, you know, the, the table's so tight with, you know, not playing so many games. And I think a lot of teams are dealing with the whole situation of the schedule this year and how it's been. And so, a lot of teams haven't been super consistent. So it's really important to kind of keep ourselves up the table and, you know, <clears throat> to keep getting three points or, or, or one points or ties away from home, that type of thing. Uh, you know, the game, I think it's going to be a similar type of situation for us. We need to really commit to sacrificing ourselves to the, to the betterment of the team and to give everything we have to fight for these three points. Um, you know, hopefully this week we've been working on playing better and, and, you know, being better on the ball and being more uh, on the front foot, I should say. So hopefully that side of the game improves as well, but we need to keep the kind of the resilience and the effort that we put into last, last week's goal. Yeah, Tom, I want to ask about training this week too, because you've kind of touched upon it a little bit. I mean, we have a tendency to think of this break between games, this break between games going from Sunday to Saturday and thinking of the physical recovery, the opportunity it gave you guys to actually kind of physically rest. But the flip side of it is it actually gives you guys 
four training sessions in a row, which you haven't had basically for a month, especially for some of the new guys, how important is it for this group to actually just have a chance ahead of this Philly game to get on the field and train together for a few days? Yeah, no, I think it's incredibly important. Um, you know, it's kind of nice having the game so quick together because all you're doing is kind of recovering, getting ready for the next game, you get to play again, you get to play again. And, you know, that's what everybody loves to do the most. But, you know, it, it, it is important to have opportunities to kind of improve as a team and to, to work on the things you need to work on. And when you're playing every three days or four days, it's extremely difficult to do so because basically you're trying to recover from one game. Once you kind of recover, you're preparing for the next game. And so you can't quite really work too much on the things you need to work on. And so these four days has been great so far. Uh, we're three days into it now. Yeah, three days into it now. And so we've been able to kind of address and, and work on some things that we need to work on. And so hopefully we'll see the benefit of that this weekend. And Philly sits at second in the East with 18 points. And you guys are only four points back at 14. I know there's still 13 games left in this season, just being such a crazy year. But how closely are you guys looking at the standings? Because, you know, if you get three points, you, you jump a big gap at that point. Yeah, uh, no, I, I don't think we've really been, you know, staring at the standings and being like, oh, this is what we need to do. This is what we don't need to do. We're really just focused on being as well prepared as we can for our next opponent and doing everything we can to get a result out of that game. But, you know, like you said, like the, the table is extremely tight and, you know, teams that can start picking up a few wins, they're going to move up that table extremely quickly. And, you know, the flip side is going to happen as well. The teams that are teams that struggle, they're going to drop down the table very quickly. And especially because, we don't have that many games this year, so it's going to be different than other years. So it's important to keep picking up results. Philly has been a team that's picked up quite a few results in their past few games. They're coming off of a 3-0 win over the New York Red Bulls, and they've also won three of their last four. What types of challenges will they pose on Saturday? Yeah, I, I, you know, first off, they're at home, so they're going to be comfortable, more comfortable at home. Um, and they're just – they're an aggressive team that makes the game difficult. They they want to press. They want to get the ball forward fast. They want to put a lot of pressure on, you know, the opponent, so us, and try to force mistakes, try to force bad decisions or late recoveries and try to take advantage of that. And so we need to be prepared for that. We need to be prepared that, you know, they're going to – they're going to ramp up the pressure on us and we need to be able to deal with that. And we need to be able to bypass their pressure and find opportunities for us to, you know, be on the front foot in the game. And I know that you weren't quite with the squad during this time, but the refs have already played Philly twice. And with the whole travel remaining regionally at this point, is there an extra element of rivalry that's kind of added between these regional teams because you could be seeing each other so many times over the next few months? Yeah. I mean, I would think so. And in, in you know, this will, I haven't quite been in the situation where I played so many games against one team in a very short space amount, or a very short amount of time. But it makes it more difficult when you keep playing kind of the same teams because you just play against them. And so you know what they're trying to do and you, you experience it yourself on the field. And so it makes it more difficult the more you play teams of kind of they're able to adjust more to more what you're doing and vice versa. So it'll be interesting to see. And I know we talked a little bit about the schedule and you guys have a longer break between these two games, but now that you've had a couple of weeks with the condensed schedule under your belt, what are your overall thoughts on this new format? Yeah. I mean, I just want to play as many games as possible. I mean, uh, this is my job, but not only is it my job, this is, this is my, my love, this is my passion. And, you know, playing the games is the best part. And so, Unfortunately, we, we had a lot of time off this year because of everything. Um, and so now to be able to play again, I'm just, I'm happy to play as many games as possible. It doesn't matter for me if we're a little bit more tired or not tired with the travel same day, that type of thing. I want to take advantage of the window that we have to play games and to get as many in as possible. And I know that there, you, you talked about the physical recovery a little bit between games, but how important is it for players to be committed mentally, just knowing that these games so, come so quickly? It sounds like you're in a great headspace wanting to play as many games as possible. How does that help players as you're moving forward through this crazy rapid fire type of games? Yeah, I mean, it, it's critical. Everybody always talks about recovery and that they only kind of discuss the physical side of things because it's kind of, it's what you see, it's what you know, and it's what you can relate to the most. But the mental side of it is extremely important too, to kind of be able to, if you have a bad result or a bad individual performance to, you know, address it 
obviously you need to address it. You can't just forget about it, but then you need to be able to move on and move forward and have a positive attitude about what's to come. Um, you know, also mentally you need to be engaged and aware that, you know, there's only a short amount of time between this game and next game. And you need to be eating the right things. You need to be taking care of yourself, making sure you're sleeping and that side of things. It's not like you get one or two days off and you can kind of, you know, take a little bit of time to yourself or something like that. But no, you need to stay on top of it. It's extremely important. Is that something that you discovered at a certain time in your career? I feel like when players are younger and people in general, you know, you just kind of have that mentality. You can eat whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. At what point did you kind of realize Sorry, my dog is barking in the background. <laughs> I hope he's all right. Um, at what point in your career did you kind of realize, like, it, it's more of an all-encompassing type of deal? Yeah, I learned it pretty quickly. Uh, I learned it my freshman year at Brown. Um, so I came in extremely fit. We had to do a three-mile test in under 18 minutes and was able to pass it and was excited about playing. And you know, then I was a freshman and was in eating from the the cafeteria that served yourself, that has ice cream, that has, you know, waffles. And so I learned, um, I gained maybe a little bit of weight and it affected how I was playing my freshman year. And I kind of, it took me a few weeks to kind of realize this, like, oh, hold on, this is affecting me. And to kind of realize that I need to take care of myself more. And so... Yeah, I learned that age pretty pretty young, or learned that lesson pretty young, probably about 18. And I, we want to ask you a few questions just about you as a person and what you like doing in your spare time, because, you know, we, we've seen you on the field, but we want to know about what Tommy McNamara is like off of the field. So I'm just going to play off of that one, talking about the dining hall and types of food. Do you have a go-to meal, and do you enjoy cooking? I have a go-to meal. It's chicken parm and spaghetti. Love um, that. Yeah, love that since I was a kid. I I can't say I enjoy cooking, but I do cook. I cook almost all the time. I, I don't eat out very often now, obviously, I'm, but just for um, for health reasons and diet reasons, it's important. What would be your choice of meal that you cook? Do you cook the chicken parm or is that more of a treat meal that you go out and get? No, no, that's a treat. Uh, no, it's cook, cook very plain. Uh, salmon, chicken, something like that, and then just steamed vegetables or a salad, and then maybe rice or maybe a sweet potato. Pretty basic, kind of just, it's healthy, it's all good for me, it's clean. I can't argue with it, I love all those. <laughs> I was gonna say you can get together with Henry Kessler, he said it pretty much the same thing. He's making all his own meals for really the first time as you know, a, a rookie now kind of living on his own, but uh, he said it's like super basic. It's basically just like fish, rice, veggies, boom. So you guys can, you can, <laughs> go back and forth and, and make each other meals. Yeah, he's a fellow New Yorker. I'll look out for him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll maybe we'll we'll, uh, we'll start exploring some better recipes or something like that together. There you go. We asked him, uh, I think it was two weeks ago on the podcast, because he said he had been making tilapia and brown rice like back in April when we spoke with him. And I, I think we asked him if he's still making that same meal. And he said he had not branched out yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds similar to me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Tommy, what is your favorite TV show? Oh, man, my favorite TV show. I really like Big Brother and Survivor, to be honest, the CBS okay. show. Okay, Survivor. There's definitely some Survivor watchers on the team. Did, have you talked with Scott Caldwell about Survivor? Yeah, we were. Uh, <laughs> oh, so speaking of knowing Scott, this was going back to 2015. Patrick Mullins was obviously traded to New York City, and I was there. We lived together. And I was into Survivor and Pat wasn't, but I got him into it. And then <laughs> we had a Survivor pool between um, me, Pat, Scotty Caldwell, and um, Donnie. Donnie from, Smith? Yes, from the, from the Carolinas. Yeah, and the four of us, because they both watched. And so, like, you know, in a group text or whatever. So I forgot about that, but it's funny you bring that up. I was going to say, as soon as, as soon as Survivor comes up, Scotty's all over it. I and mean, we've asked him a million times, you know, if if the team was on Survivor, if the whole team was on Survivor, who would win? And he's Scotty, who's the one of the more humble guys you will ever meet in your life, is like, if we were on Survivor, I would win. Like he's convinced that he would win, which is a shocking answer from Scotty because he's not that type of guy. Yeah. But he's convinced if there was a team Survivor, that he would he would outsmart everybody. I mean, he's a smart guy. Plus, he's yeah. probably watched it since he's a kid, so he knows what to expect. 
<laughs> I, I think he'd win too. I'm just surprised that he says that about himself. That's, yeah. that's the surprising part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's I'm, pretty... I'm going to follow up too on going from TVs to movies. Cause like I mentioned, I was watching a, a couple previous interviews and I know you mentioned being into Adam Sandler movies. Yeah. And there was, this had popped up on Twitter. I think yesterday, actually, it was going around. Someone had asked the question, what's your Adam Sandler Mount Rushmore? So if you were going to pick four Adam Sandler characters from his movies, your top four Adam Sandler movies, your top four Adam Sandler characters, like who's on your Adam Sandler Mount Rushmore? Oh, man, uh, that's difficult because they're kind of two separate things in my head a little bit. I really like his movies with. Um... Oh, man, I'm blanking on her name. Drew Barrymore? Yes, thank you. I'm saying, yeah, she's been in like a million of his movies. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, so two, uh, my, probably my two favorite movies are are The Blended, which is a newer one with them, and Fifty First Dates. Um, but in terms of his characters, I mean Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore have to go on there, and I like uh, is it Little Nicky or Big Nicky. What is it? Little Nicky. Little Little Nicky. Nicky. I mean, I'm not sure what the fourth one would be. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think probably, it's as for characters, I'd probably put those three for sure. But I think I enjoy the most the the those two movies with Drew Barrymore. Okay, yeah, I uh, I think oh the water boy the water boy would be my yeah favorite. oh so, yeah yeah so for me one hundred percent Happy Gilmore Billy Billy Madison I mean that's like they're easily the first two up there Bobby Boucher from Water Boy yeah. for sure and then I love Wedding Singer so Robbie Hart in the Wedding Singer. Is that's he's he's on Mount Rushmore for me as well. I forgot about Wedding Singer, which I which has which Drew Barrymore is in it too. So yeah, that's a very good one too. I'm not gonna lie, I I probably get a lot of crap for this, but one Adam Sandler movie that is I think is pretty watchable. Have you seen Don't Mess with the Zohan? I have, but I, I <laughs> that's not a go to for mine to be honest. <laughs> I feel like that one goes super under the radar because it I mean it looks ridiculously dumb. Like the trailer just looks absurd. But I've seen it, and I, I think it's watchable. I like um, the ones that he just did, the the camp ones or whatever. I forget what they're called. You got it with the four guys. That like the grown, grown ups? Do you grown ups? Yeah. yeah, that's what it is. Gotcha, gotcha. I haven't seen that one, but I have watched Murder Mystery, which is one of the newer ones on Netflix that has a minute with Jennifer Aniston. Pretty mm -hmm. funny. Yeah. It was a good one. It was a good Netflix movie for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely a good Netflix movie. Um, and Tommy, what, what's your family like? We, we want to know a little bit about uh, your, your experience. Do you have any brothers or sisters or? I do, yeah. I got a younger brother and a younger sister. Um, How old both, are um, My brother is two and a half years younger and my sister is, she is now 23. She's turning 24 soon. Um, they're both they're both out of college. They both play college soccer. Um, big soccer family. They're both in the in the New York area right now. My brother's in my brother and his fiance are in Jersey, and my my sister's at home for the moment, but planning to move out eventually. And uh, my parents, uh, like I said, big soccer family. They both played soccer. In high school. Um, you know, my my cousins are doing that now, and and my my uncles have played so. Kind of grew up soccer was was number one for sure love that and we know you're obviously very talented at soccer but do you have any special hidden talents that people might not know about you <laughs> i get made fun of for bringing this one up no i don't really have a special hidden talent but i can wiggle my ears it's not quite the same <laughs> here, but... can we see yeah i don't know if you can see wow yeah, that's impressive <laughs> Would that ever that ever come in handy for you? Like, how how often does that come up? That's like the icebreaker. You, like, you know, tell <laughs> us something about yourself that we don't know or a hidden talent or something. Yeah. That's always, like, you know, in middle school, high school, whatever, those types of things. When you, you go in a new class and they're like, what's your icebreaker? That's mine. See, I feel like it's okay. nice to have that, though, as a go to, because I feel like yeah. if someone if someone asked me off the spot, like, oh, what's your hidden talent? I'd be like, yeah, I have no idea. So to yeah. have something like that. Even if that's the only thing you ever use it for, yeah, that's like that's good stuff. And it's easy. It's not super personable. So to people you don't know, you're not saying something super personal. It's just oh yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. A lot of people laugh at it. So. 
That is so funny. Well, I think that's all we have for you today, Tommy. Thank you so much for joining us on the Far Post podcast. We really appreciate having you and it was nice to get to know you a little bit. Yeah, no, I enjoyed it. I'm glad um, I'm glad I came on. I'm glad you invited me on. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, we'll see you guys next time on the Far Post podcast. Until then, 